Hello, my students, my sales law students. Good to see you all. I'm sorry we had to cancel class on Monday, uh, but I wasn't feeling well. It happens to the best of us. Um, but I'm making up that class time uh, for you, especially those that are taking it live. For those that are doing it asynchronously, this is typical for you. But I'm making it up by um, recording two videos, each 50 minutes long, because I think those are more digestible bites of knowledge. Um, and so I thought we'd pick up where we left off the last time. Um, we were talking about 2207, and uh, we left off at problem 15. Of course, this is about the battle of the forms when you have uh, different forms part coming in with the offer and acceptance and their different terms, which terms come into the contract. Um, and the general rule is if there's no proviso clause in the acceptance, uh, then any additional terms that are material will drop out of the contract. Uh, any additional material terms contained in the second shot in the acceptance will drop out of the contract unless there's a proviso clause, clause in that acceptance saying that this will only operate as an acceptance if you expressly assent to all the terms herein. If there is a proviso clause then, and no one expressly consents to the conditions, then you switch to uh, provision three of 2207, which says that um, the terms that come into the contract consist of those terms upon which the writings agree and, uh, and then uh, gap fillers that are provided by the UC, uh, UCC. So that's where we left off. Let's do, uh, I think, uh, problem 15 is where we were. We skip up here. That went too far. Well, we did that. The crack case. Okay. Problem 15, would the following clause in the seller's acknowledgement to the buyer's order form be a material alteration? So this is um, getting back to what is materiality. Materiality is something that's serious, something that one party should not dictate, something that uh, getting in the analysis um, causes surprise or undue hardship. Um, so that's the question here. And this is the first uh, provision. Any disputes concerning this contract shall be subject to binding arbitration. That is material. Unless there's some strange, unusual custom in an industry that um, demands arbitration every time. And it's, so it's not a surprise or a hardship. This is how they do business, which is the case here in this case cited, ICC Chemical Corp. Uh, corp uh, arbitration clause was not material because uh, it was somewhat customary. Not all, all that because it's sometimes used. My goodness, I, I would disagree with the judge there. But for the most part, anything touching dispute resolution uh, will be material. Um, but again, if it's customary, then it's not a surprise. It won't be material, and it will come in. Also here, how about a forum selection clause providing all disputes be litigated in the seller's state? Um, let me share the screen here. I think it wasn't sharing the screen. Yep, we're at problem 15. How about a forum selection clause providing that all disputes must be litigated in the seller's state? Again, it has to do with, with um, dispute resolution, which is an important right to have as a buyer or a seller. And so typically, you know, the starting point, the general rule is anything having to do with dispute resolution is material. But when you're talking about not, not just um, whether you're going to litigate or arbitrate, that's certainly more material because you're going to be stripped of your due process rights of, lit of litigation if you agree to arbitrate. That will typically be material. But forum selection clauses, that is just where are you going to litigate, just the location of it. You've seen more sympathy in the courts for corporations that have contracts of adhesion that require that uh, they um, uh, litigate in a particular forum selected by the corporation. Um, Carnival Cruise Lines is a, is a famous case about that where an old couple 
had a dispute with the Carnival Cruise Lines. They're taking their dream vacation. Things went wrong. They sued, and they were forced to litigate in Miami, even though they lived in Washington State. Uh, it was very inconvenient for them, uh, but the court allowed it. And so, um, forum selection is getting a little less uh, protection in the courts. Is what I would say. Okay. Then there's um, uh, a question about the CISG. These clauses were an acknowledgement of the international sales of goods. Will it be valid? Um, we could look into that, but it's not a, a focus of the class. So let's skip over that and uh, keep moving forward. I did not ask you to read this case, but problem 16, I did ask you to, to read about a tugboat. Who buys tugboats anymore? Well, a lot of people. It's not people I know, I guess. Um, the problem 16 has to do with that. And this is the problem that really introduces the curveball in today's class, the addition to our knowledge. And that is, um, uh, but we'll get there. Let me read the, let me read the problem. Uh, the purchase order of the buyer ordered a tugboat and the fine print demanded that the tugboat be warranted for a two year period. The tugboat's uh, seller's acknowledgement form contained a statement that disclaimed all warranties. Okay. Neither party read the other's form, so the tugboat was shipped, accepted, and then they had big problems remaining afloat. That's serious. And then they want to sue, and they're going to sue. When you sue under a sales agreement, it's typically a breach of a warranty. That's what you're looking for. A breach of quality or title to the to the goods, some warranty, which we'll be getting into um, maybe in the next video. Um, but the issue here, there were two forms exchanged, but there there wasn't a an additional term. It wasn't a material additional term. Here we have what's called a different term, right? Because both parties address warranties. One says that there's a disclaimer of all warranties. The other one says that um, it's warrant, you have a warranty for two year period. So jurists, and this is one of the shortcomings of, of the UCC article 2207, is that we clearly address additional material terms right here in 2207-2. The additional terms are gonna fall out of the contract if they materially alter. But what if it's not additional, it's just different? And that's what we have here. And the, the law um, has been largely settled. We have a solution to this. And I asked you to read the uh, next case that was written by the great intellectual economist, Judge Posner, uh, Fields uh, Court judge, but also a uh, uh, law professor. Um, Northrop Corporation versus Electronic Industries. In this case, is the uh, is beautifully written, typical of Posner, uh, very clear analysis, and it comes it, it resolves itself in this solution, that the additional different terms knock each other out. So in this case, we have uh, these two different terms regarding the warranty. Boom, they knock each other out. Because if the parties haven't agreed on something that's serious, why should one party be able to dictate to the other party? It's um, it's not fair. And uh, and so if you have two different provisions, they knock each other out. What does that mean? Well, then they'll just be the the uh, as we'll soon learn when we discuss uh, warranties. Then the warranties will come into the contract automatically. They come in unless they're disclaimed. So if your know, disclaimer gets knocked out, then you're going to be subject to the warranties. Uh, so that was the issue here. And uh, so the answer would be, if I had to advise the client whether the contract includes a warranty, uh, yes, it does. It's a warranty that's going to be supplied by law because these provisions knock each other out. And so let's pick apart now. I want to dissect this somewhat complicated fact pattern in Northrop uh, versus Electronic. And um, Excuse me. 
and uh, then we'll get, a, I think, a clearer understanding of the problem here. Uh, so now let's get back to this famous case, Northrop Corporation versus Electronic Industries. Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for Seventh Circuit, 1994. And this is uh, an important case because it clarifies this in, in what Posner says was a mistake in the drafting. He actually says, and I'll pull up the case in a second, we'll look at it. He said there was a mistake in the drafting that the, the drafters of the UCC really intended in 22072 to say any material additional or material different terms uh, will drop out. Um, and so that's what this case is getting to, what to do with these materially uh, different terms, not an additional term that wasn't addressed by the former form, but um, a, a different term that did something different than the, the first form did. So I know, so that's kind of a word salad. I'll try to keep it straight. Um, but now let's look at the, at the uh, case here. Let me share my screen. Uh, the Northrop case, Northrop Corporation, now known as Northrop Grumman, one of the great defense industry corporations, part of the industrial military complex of the, of the United States. Um, this is a battle of the forms question with regard to this incredibly uh, large company. Imagine having this on your desk, which you guys will. Um, so the Northrop Corporation uh, wanted to purchase some, some motherboards, some electronic motherboards for some weaponry. They sell incredible weaponry all around the world. Uh, and they need computer components for that. And so what they did is they, they sent out a request for proposals, a request for offers. And you hear of that all the time with the government or with large corporations. They have a big project. They say, hey, tell us um, how much you can do for you can uh, do this for. And so then you get the response. You get the offers from the suppliers. And that's what happened here. And so the request for offers has no legal significance. It's not considered an offer. It's just saying, hey, give us an offer and then maybe we'll accept. Um, and so that's what happens. And they send out these uh, offers to them. And then uh, Northrop Grumman sends out what purchase orders, right? So let me take a look at this. Uh, they send out purchase orders. Um, and so normally we think of purchase orders as the second or the first document, the first form that's sent out. Um, but in this case, it was the, um, the offer to sell that was the first form. And the purchase order was the second form, which was served as the acceptance. Okay, so wrap your heads around that either side can make the first move. The buyer can offer to buy something, which is what happened, or offer, the uh, seller can offer to sell something rather than the buyer sending a purchase order to purchase something. That's what happened here. The sellers made their offer to sell things to Northrop Grumman and, um, <clears throat> and they accepted electronics. Let's see, I'm sure I did that right. Electronics Industries. Uh, which was this electronics manufacturer to sell them these motherboards. And things went badly. And there was uh, a desire to sue for a breach of warranty, which is the basis of, of uh, most contractual disputes, that the, the goods were not up to snuff, did not suffice to, to satisfy the warranty of merchantability warranty of fitness or title, express warranties. We'll, uh, we'll learn all, all about that very soon. But uh, that came up here. And, uh, but the issue was that we had um, in, the, in the offer that was made right by the seller, 
Electronic to Northrop, uh, their offer uh, contained uh, uh, an unlimited warranty. No, no, I'm sorry. Contained the, it was the seller that contained the limited warranty. It was limited to 90 days, All right? Because sellers always want to protect themselves, limit their liability. So the seller sent out this offer saying, I want to sell you these motherboards, but your warranty is limited to 90 days. And then uh, Northrop responds with a, a form that accepts this offer, but um, ex expects a, uh, an unlimited warranty. So now that's the battle of the forms that's been set up. Right, and uh, Northrop Grumman wants um, an unlimited warranty. Uh, the seller, of course, wants the limited 90-day warranty. There was a telephone call in the in the uh, facts of the case as well, but it was determined to not have had any legal significance. But I don't want to make this more complicated than it already is. Um, and so what you have here is that question of not additional terms, not a material additional terms, but you have material different terms. Right, one saying unlimited warranty, one saying 90 day warranty. It's not one, uh, the offer being silent and the acknowledgement um, offering a, um, a new term. It's when they both address the same issue. These are called different terms. And, um, and Judge Posner, the great economist, law professor, uh, judge, um, decided, he first uh, explains that there are a couple of alternatives, but that the appropriate uh, thing to do is to actually accuse the drafters of having made a mistake. That they intended to um, include with, in additional terms, that, that, that idea of additional terms in 2, 2, 2072. Um, also different terms, that is ones that, um, that competed against one another when there was this, a provision in each form regarding the same issue, such as dispute resolution. Um, and so that is the approach that Judge Posner took and it's become the majority um, position of the judiciary and most importantly in Ohio. If we practice here, it's going to change from state to state, but I think it's the majority rule now, but certainly in Ohio. And um, and so there you go. If you have um, either you know one form silent, offer silent, and then the second form has uh, a material term addressing something that's additional, that term drops out. That means that you're silent as to that entire issue because the first form didn't have anything. And the second form that did address dispute resolution, for example, drops out. So you have nothing regarding uh, dispute resolution. And so you fall back on, on civil procedure and common law, what courts have jurisdiction over the matter, et cetera, personal jurisdiction. Um, and if you have the... Uh, other scenario where you have two uh, different terms that address the same issue, say one says litigate and one says arbitrate, they both address dispute resolution. What's the result? They knock each other out. They drop out. And so um, you're left uh, with nothing, with a gap. And that's the same in the earlier situation when the um, material additional term drops out. You're left with nothing. Neither party will have addressed it according to the court. And so you just fall back on the normal law and, and uh, or the common law and civil procedure. And the same is true if you have um, uh, material different terms. They knock each other out. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to impo impose contractual terms on parties if they were not agreed to, if there's not a meeting of the mind. There's no meeting of the mind, then we don't want to impose this contractual term 
it's just better to um, knock out the terms and and just imply the terms that are reasonable. If it's a different price, they'll knock each other out and we apply the market price. If the, the different delivery terms or days, knock each other out, provide uh, whatever is, is uh, under the common law or the UCC, a reasonable delivery time, reasonable terms of delivery. So that is what uh, the Northrop case teaches us and it, it helps give us some certainty in this, in this very tricky uh, field of the battle of the forms. And at least we know what to do with now uh, different material terms. Okay, we've got one more, one more question to do in this assignment. Hold on a second. Just in this, hold on. Okay, much better. Okay, we have one more question left in this assignment, and then we'll be done with contract formation and the determination of what terms come into a contract. That is the battle of the forms. Um, the last problem is problem 17. And I can, uh, let me see. Share my screen, share my screen. <clears throat> like thus, thusly, and uh, we can look at this problem together. Problem 17. Um, all right, this will put a fine point on our understanding of the battle of the forms. Uh, on April 25th, Plastic Furniture Mart sent a purchase order for 100 tables to the Erzatz Manufacturing Company. In addition to the usual boilerplate language, the purchase order also stated, buyer objects in advance to any terms proposed by seller that differ in any way from the terms of this purchase order. And that is, of course, a reference to um, 22072A, which says that if the offer expressly limits acceptance to the terms of the offer, uh, then the terms won't come into the contract. Any additional terms of, in the acknowledgement will not come into the contract. So if you are uh, a buyer, and uh, you know, often companies will be both buyers and sellers. So when you're representing your client on the buying side uh, and you're sending out purchase orders, um, you should consider including this. Um, this is a way to make sure that your um, uh, terms will come into the contract. So that's a, a practice pointer on the buyer side. Um, and now we go on. Uh, Erzatz received the order on May 3rd, sent back its own acknowledgement form, Battle of the Forms, which disclaimed all warranties. Okay, that's important. That's, uh, of course, the seller always wants to disclaim warranties, reduce their liability, uh, limit damages. Um, and so that, that's an important term that's going to, to be very important to the seller. Make sure we get this uh, disclaimer in there. Uh, but in addition, it had this provision. This is not an acceptance unless buyer assents to all changes made by this acknowledgement form. A proviso clause, which is of course referenced in 22071, where um, it says an acceptance will not uh, operate, will not operate as an acceptance if the acceptance is expressly made conditional on assent to the additional or different terms. So that's something that you include in the acknowledgement forms. So that's when you, you are representing your client on the seller side and you're uh, drafting their acknowledgement forms. What do you put in there? Do you use a proviso clause? Well, it's an option to you, uh, for you, but who really came out on top here? Let's see. They, the the uh, attorney here um, for the seller will, decided to include a proviso clause. So did that help their case at the end of the day? 
Of course, neither party read the details of each other's forms, of course. And on May 6th, there's that ship to tables. Is there a contract? Uh, there is, just because uh, they, they performed. And we know that mere performance at the end of the day is enough evidence that, yeah, there was a deal, there was a contract. And the question is now, what are the terms of that contract? And uh, specifically, did Erzatz make a warranty as to the conditions of the tables? Now, did the seller here, in other words, did it successfully get its disclaimer into the contract? Did its disclaimer come into the contract? That's the question. And uh, of course, the answer is, is uh, no. So because they used the proviso clause and there wasn't any explicit consent to the different terms, which included the, the disclaimer. Um, and so we're shunted down to the to provision three of 2207, which means all the different terms drop out. You know, the terms of the agreement are only the terms on which the writings agree. So uh, the, if there's, they don't agree as to the warranty or disclaimer, and so all of that language drops out. And so there's a, there's no, there's no provisions addressing warranties. Um, but that means that the, the, uh, the warranty will come in because unless you successfully disclaim a warranty, like the warranty of merchantability, it will come in automatically. You have to, you know, the, the automatic, there's automatic consumer protection. The ability to disclaim it uh, for, by the seller, but you've got to do it properly and you got to make sure that your disclaimer comes into the contract. So it seems to give you a lot of power, this proviso clause. You're saying this will only operate as an acceptance if you assent to all the terms herein. Otherwise, it's a counter offer, is the upshot. Um, you know, that sounds really. Um, powerful and kind of blustery, throwing your weight around as a lawyer. But at the end of the day, what, what your goal is as a lawyer is to get that disclaimer in there. And so this didn't do the job. And uh, I'll just finish up this discussion by uh, asking you, and we've touched on this before, what would do the job? What would you do as a, as a lawyer knowing that this proviso clause isn't really going to protect you. You're not going to sleep well at night. Um, so what do you do to protect your client and to give yourself the ability to sleep well at night? Well, you, you create some mechanism to get the explicit assent to the terms as the proviso clause uh, demands. You require that before the transaction moves forward, before this can operate, as an acceptance, we need your signature here. And then we can go forward. And all of those terms will come in, all the seller's terms. But you need that extra assent. Or what's another uh, way you could do it? Um, you could uh, negotiate if the, if the transaction is big enough, you can decide not to, to exchange forms, but to, to negotiate a single unitary contract. And so now that takes time and money. You got to get lawyers to do that, but that's uh, that's another option if you don't want to take the risk of your disclaimer not coming in. You want to make sure it gets in there. Then then negotiate a, a contract and have everyone sign it. Um, so you know those are some of the approaches you could make. You could also uh, you could also tell the buyer um, we received your purchase order, but. We only uh, fill orders that are placed through our website. So I'm sorry for any inconvenience, but uh, I'm gonna direct you to the website at www.erzotsmanufacturing.com and we'll be glad to take your order there. And um, they log on there and you have uh, your terms, uh, which include the, the disclaimer on the warranty. And in order, if they wanna buy anything, they're going to have to click a little box agreeing to it. It's just like signing, a, you know, and giving explicit assent to that term, and that's going to be your contract. They don't have a form. <clears throat> so you're going to get them to sign this unitary contract by going on your website, and so you you can fix 
uh, this problem about the uncertainty of the terms of the contract. And you can take back control of the terms with certainty um, if you establish these mechanisms, but you have to establish these mechanisms. If you just re rely on exchanging the forms, um, it's going to be a big mess and your disclaimer probably won't come in. Okay. Well, uh, let's end our discussion of the Battle of the Forms there. And that's also the end of our discussion of the early part, the birth, the contract formation, the adolescence of the contract when they're finding out who they are, you know, what are their terms. Um, and now we're getting into um, more, um, uh, now we're getting into a new, a new segment of the course, um, and that is warranties which are at the heart of many, if not most disputes uh, regarding the sale of goods. And they are at the heart of, the, of Article 2. And there are four different warranties. And we're going to learn uh, in the next edition of Secured Transactions um, how, what they are, how they're created, and also how to disclaim them. And uh, so I'll see you in the, in the next video. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it.